Hello and welcome to part two of our um, study of the origins of the uh, English language as it is used in um, sounds in North America, particularly the United States. Um, we're picking up where we la uh, uh, left off in the last video and we're going to talk about a 17th century American English, which would have been closer to how British English um, was uh, spoken at the time. And of course, both American and British English have changed since the 17th century, during the early period of colonization. But it so happens that we have a <clears throat> variety of American English that is almost like a fossil of that early colonial English frozen in time. And it is spoken, or it was spoken, um, it's dying out sadly, uh, on Tangier Island in the Chesapeake Bay. You can see here on the eastern co uh, coast, there's Washington, D.C. This is the Chesapeake Bay. Up at the top is Philly. And here in this remote fishing village, for centuries, um, the descendants of English settlers lived with very, very little contact with the outside world. They lived off their uh, fishing and their local gardening and agriculture. And um, there wasn't a, a ferry or, or a bridge. Um, and so the... Um, the language was especially uh, was was more or less fro frozen in a lot of ways and changed very little. So if you go into the PowerPoint and you click here, you will um, get a short video that will demonstrate what this language sounded like. Um, we could also uh, get an example of early um, British English um, or, or early American English and its connection to British English um, in another remote community that's spoken by fishermen, again, or fi uh, fishing communities in the outer banks of North Carolina. And here you can um, hear a resemblance between how they speak and the, and how they speak in the West Country in British English, and I told you before about how they have that strong R sound. Another thing that they do is they voice S's. So instead of saying um, uh, sometimes, they'll say sometimes. Or instead of saying Somerset, they call it Zummerzet, right? And um, you can hear that feature in both of these. And again, if you go into the power, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm not going to give you a video within a video, H-E-L-ception. Um, but if you go in, you can click both of these and learn about the West Country dialect and, and hear its resemblance to samples of the um, Outer Banks speech. Now, there's actually um, African-American community in the, island, in the Sea Islands off of South Carolina, which also preserve features of what must have been an early um, African English Creole. Uh, but we'll talk about that more in a subsequent video on African American vernacular English in week 14. Um, but overall, there um, is in American English a much greater uniformity, a much greater similarity between um, the various regions than there is in England. In England, the difference between how English is spoken um, in the Lowland Scots versus uh, the North Country versus the Southeast versus the Midlands versus the Southwest is significantly different. Um, now, those, those were differences are reducing over there, too. But American English has always been more uniform relative to uh, British English. So why is that? Um, one is that people who came to America um, moved around more. And so you got a mixture of the different regional origins. You know, I know people whose ancestors came to New Jersey, but then they moved to the South and they moved back to the North and then people. So there's, oh, there's mobility among settlers. And in any one area you were, you might find, even in uh, the mid Atlantic or the Northeast, a mixture of or of regional origins in Britain. So that, um, features kind of like flow together more. Um, another uh, another couple sort of um, sources of the uniformity in the, of the English language in America was the sense of being a common people who wanted to speak a common language. And this was associated in part with the project of Noah Webster, um, who was an American patriot in what's called the early Republic period. And he wrote the American Dictionary of the English Language. And in this, fixed some of the features that uh, 
distinguish American English um, often uh, in ways that are that are more visual or, or, or in written English rather than spoken English. Um, Noah Webster was born in Connecticut in 1758, so he was an uh, a young man. He came of age during the American Revolution, and he was an advocate for the Constitutional Convention of 1789 that resulted in our current uh, government. Um, he was an advocate for cultural independence of the United States and American language with its own distinctive idiom, pronunciation, and style. He wrote a compendious dictionary of the English language in 1806, and then um, expanded it in 1828, and uh, he included as many Americanisms as he possibly could, words like skunk and hickory and chowder, some of which are, of course, loan words from indigenous uh, words. Um, but he also uh, advocated for particular for spelling reform and, and introduced a number of, of American spellings that he thought would be better. Some of them uh, uh, stuck, as you can see here, music and center and plow. Some of them, not so much, tongue and women. Now, you can sort of see the logic here, but it just didn't catch on. The influence of British English and British books and writing uh, continued to um, persuade, uh, continued to affect America. So Webster's vision was only partially completed now, Webster died in 1843, upon which um, a couple of entrepreneurial publishers um, in Springfield, Massachusetts, um, by the name of Merriam, acquired the rights to his dictionary, and that's why it's known to us as the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Um, another unique thing about American English and American culture is the um, fact that we uh, came up with, why is it that we have a dollar and not a pound? Why do they have a pound in Great Britain, and, and how did we come to adopt the dollar instead? Um, there's, a, there's a link here in this article on the history of the dollar and the name, but basically it comes from the fact that uh, most of the currency in the New World for a couple hundred years um, was minted by and circulated by Spain because um, the Spanish Empire uh, was established in, in what is now Latin America earlier and more extensively, and it was a, um, one of the, its main resources that it extracted was gold and silver. And they, um, and they minted coins in the New World and circulated them. And here is an early, um, what was called a Taller. And Taller is from a German word meaning valley, because a lot of the, the first Tallers were, were coins were minted in um, a, a place in, in Austria, I think, called, or Bohemia, called the Joachim's Tower, the Valley of Joachim. And there, this was um, because of the union of this area of Central Europe with Spain under the Habsburg empires, uh, the Spanish adopted talero, which turned into dolare, which turned into English dollar. And um, there's theories as to where the dollar sign came from. Is it, is it the legs of Hercules here? Or is it these these pillars here that, that got combined? But uh, in any case, when the United States started minting its own money early on, it referred to it as a dollar, since that was the name that people generally used for um, uh, coins that were already in circulation. Um, okay, smash cut. Uh, um, here's a video here on Appalachian English that you might find interesting. Um, there are a lot of cultural connections between Ozark and Appalachian English. Um, the people from Appalachia came and were many of the first set, uh, white settlers in the Ozarks. And things that um, Appalachian and the Ozarks share in common are a number of Celticisms, that is, words that come directly from Irish and Scot from from Irish and Scots, archaicisms, that is, words that have been. Um, uh, that are old. Basically, it's like archaeology is old stuff. It's it's old older forms that have dropped out in other forms of English and Scots words like um, ingerns for onions, form nescent next to, quild is an Elizabethan pronunciation of coiled. Um, and there's some other ones here that are hilarious. Poke, uh, like a pig in a poke, that's um, from a, a Scots Gaelic word. Um, Blinked is a word that's used in Appalachian that means spoiled or sour, and apparently this goes back to a folk tra uh, tradition that, that if a witch blinked at milk, she would spoil it. Um, 
And uh, there's Ari for any. I haven't seen Ari of them. Um, there's there's other features that are part of. Uh, um, let me think. Uh, the word bus, B-U-S-S, -S, bus someone, um, is to kiss. And you find that in Shakespeare, and you also find it in Appalachian and Ozarks English. Um, other thing, other Ozarks archaicisms include. The uh, persistence of strong verbs it, that are not strong verbs in standard English or, or different forms of strong verbs. Yeah, uh, you can't live in this area for very long without hearing somebody describe how they drug something somewhere, right? And that, that's an example of that. I hope him for I helped him. I clomb up the tree. I rid to the store instead of I rode to the store. Um, another, another sort of a... Uh, Ozark's features is prefix dropping, moration for admiration, you side for decide, um, and these pos possessives of ourn, yorn, hisn, herin, theren. If you again, if you if you talk to some of the older folks in this in this region, you'll you'll hear this. Although again, there is a tendency towards increasing uniformity. A lot of these features have um, faded over time, but they're. Um, it's a sort of a folklorist named Vance Randolph uh, from the Ozarks region who wrote a great book called Down in the Holler uh, back in 1953. I gave my copy back to the library, but they have like 10 of them. Um, and this is sort of a, a pretty detailed exploration of Ozark um, English and folkways, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, other features that are more generally um, part of American English that are archaic that is old-fashioned, fallen out of use in the UK, right? They're not archaic here, but they're, they're um, forms that are older or more conservative that have since fallen out of the use in, in the UK. And this is one of the things that accounts for the differences between American and British uh, English as well. So the sound in flat and path um, is a word that the British have stopped using. Like, so they say flop, path. Um, and, but we keep using that, but if you are actually to go back to Shakespeare's time, if you were to go back to the 16th and 17th century, then they would say, um, they would say it like that too. And in fact, they would have pronounced father as father, um, which is how Americans would have said it before too. Um, gotten is an, is an archaic form that the, the British sort of make fun of Americans for saying gotten. Um, also, mad for angry. In Britain, mad only means like mentally ill or insane, like, have you got mad? But here it means angry. That's old fashioned too. Um, saying we're fall in, for the season instead of autumn. In, in Britain, they pretty much only say autumn, not fall. Um, and so that's, but that's like an old fashioned middle, that goes back to Middle English calling uh, the season fall. Autumn is is a Latin borrowing, right? So a little inkhorn action there. And there will be these other little bits. Uh, yonder a piece, I've a mind to. Breeches for pants. Do you reckon? Um, Axe for ask. All of these are old-fashioned features of American English. Um, American English also has this layer, this sediment, this superstrate is the technical linguistic term, of uh, Hispanisms that come from its contact with uh, Spanish settlers and its conquest of a region of which includes California, Colorado, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, all of which was part of Mexico until like the early 1840s in the Mexican-American War. And so the word buckaroo comes from um, a Spanish word vaquero, meaning cowboy. Chaps, like riding chaps, actually comes from the Spanish word chaparrera. Um, pancho, lasso is from a Spanish word lazo. A uh, quirt, which is a kind of whip from quarta whip. Uh, the 10 gallon hat is an interesting because it doesn't actually refer to the volume of the hat, but it comes from galon, a Spanish word meaning braid. Other words, adobe, bronco, which refers to a horse, but is it just a more general Spanish word meaning rough or wild? Um, if you, uh, machete comes from Spanish. And if you live in the Southwest, uh, or ever have, you've heard of arroyos, which are like a culvert or runoff ditch, and that's from, Spanish too. So this is just um, part of one sort of important area that is um, uh, influ that has influenced um, American English. This, this 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 contact with Southwestern, especially in Latin American Spanish words. Of course, uh, Mexican English has also been um, affected by 
North American English. Uh, like you know, you know, you know the, the, they they borrow a lot of words from us. Like the the Mexican word for bug spray is killer, as in like bug killer, right? So um, there's language languages meet and they trade words. Um, but this has just been a kind of overview of of where American English came from, in what ways it resembles and comes from British English. Uh, the ways that it departs from British English, or in fact preserves features of British English that have dropped out of use, and some of the other um, uh, things that have affected our language. I mean, some of some of the ch differences in, as um, Seth Lear talks about in Inventing English, some of the differences have to do with differences in nature, material, culture, names of plants, names of trees, and sometimes, of course, as you might know, the same word refers to different things in America versus in England. So like the British, the British robin is a different species of bird than, than the American uh, robin. And the, you know, they're, they, they have a badger, we have a badger, which are related, but they're different species. They saw them, yeah, it's a bird badger, close enough. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, the whole the old joke about two languages divided by, uh, oh, I forget how it goes, look it up. Um, in any case, in the next video, we're going to talk about um, UK English and where it's gone in the last couple hundred years and uh, its own story. So tune in for that and have a great day.